good evening and welcome. It's great to see everybody here tonight. Uh, I'm Brad Belk, president of the Sherwood Raider Farm Civil War Park Incorporated. First off, I would like to thank our co-sponsors, the Southwest Archaeological Society and the Missouri Southern State University Social Science Department. We greatly appreciate your support. It is great to see many of the representatives from these two esteemed groups. Welcome. Another thank you goes to Judy Stiles, Bill Hunt, and Missouri Southern State University television station KGCS for filming tonight's program. Judy and Bill are not only extremely talented in their field, but they are two of the nicest people you will ever meet. Thank you, Judy, Bill, students, and staff for assisting us with our program this evening. Tonight we have some grand information as well as people to share with you. So let's get started. The first part of our program will entail a fantastic discovery found at the Sherwood Raider Farm Civil War Park site. Chris Dukes will enlighten us to his findings as he takes us through this, his master's thesis that he presented and successfully defended in December last year at Missouri State University. After Chris's presentation, we will take a five minute intermission to move to our second part, which will involve a roundtable discussion from four noted local Civil War authors. Following that, we will premiere a six minute film, which will give a brief overview of our future plans at the Sherwood Raider Farm Civil War Park site. Before I introduce Mr. Dukes, I want to explain the events during two days in May of 1863, when the severe brutality of the Civil War became painfully real to the soldiers and residents of western Jasper County. These two days would be remembered forever in the annals of history, leaving a lasting mark on the members of the 1st Kansas Colored Infantry Regiment and the area around the town of Sherwood, Missouri. Much has been researched and written of these volatile 48 hours. The purpose of this evening is to dig deeper into the story as we uncover additional information and evidence from these events. With that said, our keynote speaker is Chris Dukes. Chris graduated from Joplin High School in 1989. He nobly served our country during the Iraq War as a U.S. Army Supply Sergeant for the 10th Mountain Division in Baghdad. In 2010, he used his GI Bill to gain a Bachelor's of Science in Sociology from his, this fine institution, Missouri Southern State University. Without a break in schooling, Chris enrolled at Missouri State University in Springfield, which leads us tonight because it was while he was working on his master's is when his amazing discovery began. So without further ado, let's listen to this incredible story. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Chris Dukes. Thank you. Uh, this is a pretty interesting story. There's a, a lot to it. Uh, this park that they're going to have in Jasper County is over on the corner of Fountain Road and Peace Church Road, uh, just between Joplin and Carl Junction. This uh, uh, monument here is at Schifferdecker Park. And we knew a little bit about uh, what had happened there. They had dedicated the park uh, my senior year here at Missouri Southern, and um, that's kind of what planted the seed for me to be able to use it as a master's thesis later on. Uh, this is the sign there at the park that we're uh, going to create, and it was May 18, 1863 that this incident happened. To put it in perspective, this is about uh, a month and a half or so before the battle at Gettysburg. Uh, it was members of the first African American unit in the entire United States history, and uh, they were killed there at the Raider Farm, possibly unarmed, and their bodies were then mutilated. Um, at, after that, when the Union came back and found what had happened, uh, they <coughs> burnt the house with the bodies in it, along with a uh, Confederate sympathizer that they shot, and uh, the, the next day, they, uh, or that day, the next day after the Raider Farm attack, they burnt the town of Sherwood, Missouri, which with the, at the time, was the third largest town in Jasper County. Uh, Joplin did not exist at that time. A little bit of background as to what was happening at that point in the war. Um, Missouri was a divided state. They uh, were claimed by both sides. The stars on the flags, uh, both sides had a star that they claimed represented Missouri. Uh, both sides claimed Missouri. The Confederates moved the capital of the their capital from Missouri down to Neosho, Missouri, just south of here for a little while. Um, 
So this was you know, a very hotly contested state, a very divided state. Uh, the Battle of Carthage on July 5, 1861 was one of the very first, or the very first big battle of the entire Civil War. Um, it was just a little after the Fort Sumter incident. Then a little bit later, uh, you know, in August 10th of the same year, we had the Battle of Wilson's Creek. Both of these were Confederate victories, and so the Union had to retreat northward. This allowed the South to control this area of the country and its very valuable lead mines, which supplied the Confederacy with lead for their bullets for you know, a couple of years until we were able to uh, control the Mississippi, really. Um, so at this point, the South wanted to retake or conquer Missouri. So they were trying to invade Missouri, and we had the Battle of Pea Ridge um, in northwest Arkansas. That was a Union victory. So what happened was is neither side had enough troops, really, to control the area, and they were resorting to guerrilla-style attacks. Both sides utilized partisan rangers and guerrillas. Um, you know, the, the military road coming down from, from Kansas City all the way down into Oklahoma uh, was very valuable to the Union, and the Confederacy wanted to disrupt that, so these rangers, partisan rangers, or guerrillas, bushwhackers, whatever you want to call them, were attacking the whole area. And you also had just outlaws who were taking advantage of the situation and taking advantage of the chaos. Uh, so you had lots of different roaming bands uh, of riders attacking the area. Uh, this is a, a map of Jasper County back then. Um, as you can see, there's no Joplin. Uh, the town of Sherwood right here, um, and French Point is where the, the, the local guerrilla leader had his home base. These maps represent the two main forces that are fighting and their areas of operation, so they overlap. Um, on, the, on the left there, you have the Confederate guerrilla, who's Major Livingston, and all the areas that he was attacking. And on the right, you have the battles of the 1st Kansas Colored Infantry, so they were you know, fighting in the same area. The first Kansas Colored was the very, very first African-American unit of the Civil War. A lot of people think back to that uh, movie Glory uh, and the 54th Massachusetts. But the 54th Massachusetts were, were only given permission to become a, a regiment about six months after their very first fight here. Uh, these guys were fighting in Butler, Missouri, up near Kansas City. Um, in October of 1862, and the 54th Massachusetts were only uh, authorized in March of 1863. So these guys had been fighting for a while before the 54th got, got mustered. Uh, many of these people were former slaves from the area who had run to free Kansas and signed up. Um, they're very interesting people. The man in the center here was the very first African American uh, officer of the whole United States Army. His name was uh, Matthews, William Matthews. These are some of Livingston's guerrillas. Um, they were friends of his, local residents, uh, often, again, colorful characters themselves. This man here in the center, um, Dave Rusk was his name. He, he became a, uh, a U.S. Marshal in Indian Territory after, after the war. So these guys were, you know, rough... <laughs> rough and tumble riders here. This is the monument in Fort Scott that commemorates the deaths of the people at the Raider Farm. It happened on May 18th. Um, they were gathering corn or raiding the Raider Farm there for corn and supplies for their unit in Baxter Springs uh, when they were surprise attacked by Livingston's guerrillas. The Raider Farm was um, one of Livingston's men. It was Captain Raider, actually. So they were raiding one of his guys uh, houses, which of course made them very angry, and so they attacked by surprise. The blacks were supposedly it, up in the house, unarmed. They had stacked their rifles on along a fence and were throwing corn out the second story window down to wagons down below when the attack happened. Most of the written record suggests that they were just slaughtered right there, and um, then the, the white soldiers that were with them that were on horseback were chased back to Baxter Springs, about eight miles. This is a, a map of the, of the area and what had happened. 
the very next day when the Union forces came and found what they had done and, and uh, what they had done to the bodies of the soldiers, they destroyed the town of Sherwood, burned it to the ground, and there's just a cemetery now to uh, you know, show that where that was. Um, Livingston captured several of the soldiers, but he didn't want to trade the black ones. You know, he wanted to trade the white soldiers he had captured for captured Confederate whites. And at this point, there was still a sort of a code of honor going on with a lot of these, you know, they were writing letters back and forth and, and so on. Uh, but the Union commander says, no, you better treat my, all my guys like soldiers. The Confederates didn't see the blacks as equals and killed them. So the Union marched out one of their prisoners and killed him who happened to be a friend of the Confederate commander, so he got really mad and killed the white guys that he had too. So after this, it was sort of like all bets were off. The, um, the, t the burning of Sherwood, you know, was followed about a month later by the burning of Lawrence, Kansas. Now, Lawrence, Kansas was a Union uh, base at the time, and it got burned by Confederate guerrillas as well. And that caused the, uh, the general in charge up there to say, all right, enough's enough. And he issued what was called General Order 11, which authorized the depopulation of entire counties of both Missouri and Kansas, all the way down from Kansas City, down through Vernon County, which is where Nevada is at. It didn't reach all the way here, but this gives you an idea of what was going on, uh, just increase the brutality. This is what they're planning to create there at the park. Uh, they're going to have a, a cabin that's going to represent the Raider farmhouse and um, you know, provide a good museum experience for people. Now, when I looked through all of the documentary record, um, I found you know, a couple of eyewitness accounts, a couple of newspaper articles, most of which had a similar story, with a few of them uh, being outliers saying something different. But there were no real agreement on any of the sources on how many people died, how many people were there, or any of that. So that there's a lot of variation in the sources as to what, what actually happened. This again is the official casualty list of, what we, of who we know died. Okay? Now, most of the sources have the Union force at somewhere around 25 of the black infantrymen and 25 of uh, what was the second Kansas artillerymen. They were on horseback, white guys on horseback. And the guerrilla force, the, the leader of the guerrilla force, says he used 67 men. So that's probably approximately right. You know, if he's saying that, then you know, the, these numbers, like 200 guerrillas attacking us, was probably from the chaos of, of battle at the time. They just didn't know who, how many were at against them. So here's some area of general agreement. Uh, there were a few outlying sources that, that said something different than this, but most of them were in general agreement that the Union forces were surprised and defeated, uh, that they retreated westward uh, back towards Baxter Springs. There was a Fort Blair there at the time. Um, and the black soldiers ran to the woods because they were on foot while the guerrillas chased the mounted Union soldiers back to Baxter Springs. Um, now, we have a few of the, of the uh, sources saying that over the next couple of days, some of these black soldiers made it back to the fort. It also, a lot of the sources agree that the Confederates seized the, the supply wagons that the Union had there, and that the Union resistance was mostly ineffective. They were just, you know, defeated handedly. This, okay, yeah, this is uh, the artifacts that I found when I did a, a basic survey of the site. Um, this, I believe, is probably the rallying point where they were trying to make a fighting retreat. It is about a quarter mile to the west of where the Raider farm actually was. So you have, um, you know, that, that was their quarter mile in the written records that they, had, they ran to the woods. Also, the plat mats from the time um, show this to be woodlands and where the Raider farm was to be prairie. So it also tracks with what we know in the written record that they ran to the forest. The results of my archaeology, I uh, found 57 artifacts, mostly bullets. A few other small pieces, uh, a button from a uni Union uniform, the emblem and a buckle from a Union hat, um, and uh, a part of a canteen. You know. But the rest of them were bullets. Most of the bullets were dropped rounds. 
uh, indicating that people were either, that was their firing line where they were trying to fire and they were dropping them, or they were digging out their ammunition as they retreated. The, the important discovery that I made were the fired musket rounds. I think that this is, this is what really helps to challenge the written record a little bit, because these are musket rounds that show evidence of having been fired and, and hit something, which would suggest that they were at least trying to fight back, and at least not all of them were unarmed. They, some of them had weapons and were trying to resist. The red stars here are where the fired rounds were located. The rest of them were dropped rounds. So it, it kind of shows that they were going, they were retreating. These are pictures of some of the artifacts that I found, and I put uh, an example of the weapon over here on the side. These are Colt revolver bullets that would have been used by the people on horseback. I had two different kinds of carbine rounds. This is the Smith carbine rounds, and oops, and then Sharps carbine rounds. So two different kinds of carbine. They were very similar, but uh, you know a little bit different. These were all the the musket rounds, the muzzle loading musket rounds that were found there. So. This does show that they were trying to group together. They were trying to, uh, you know, stay, you know, unified as much as possible. Probably in a very chaotic situation there, but they were at least bunching together. At least one soldier was carrying an older style weapon. This uh, 69 caliber musket rounds came from an older smoothbore weapon. So if um, you know, th this is not really surprising. The black soldiers a lot of times had hand-me-down weapons, and um, they had a hard time getting enough muskets in the first place to, for their whole unit. So one of them was actually a, a round ball. So I found a Union uniform button. So unless the uh, you know, Confederates were wearing Union uniforms and, and firing muskets, I think that this artifact scatter represents the Union force. I also found a canteen spout. The rest of it had either decayed or, or been lost. This is uh, an emblem and a buckle from a hat. And somebody lost their hat and dropped their canteen as they were running into the woods trying to escape. So what does all this mean? Okay, The survey site is west of where the Raider farm was located, so that's the direction that the written record says they ran. Uh, the presence of musket rounds the remains of these Union uniforms would suggest that this is the Union, a representative of the Union forces there. The guerrillas were cavalry, and they had a slightly different tactic. They would preload a lot of their weapons, um, pistols and carbines, and have them hanging, multiple weapons hanging off of their horses. So they would fire one until it was out of ammunition and grab another one so they didn't have to reload. You know? Whereas the, the infantrymen, they had one gun. You know, they had their, their musket, and that's it. So if I'm finding all of these musket rounds and, um, and things there, I, I'm thinking this is not the, the uh, Confederate guerrillas, but rather the Union forces. 36 of 53 were, were musket rounds, so it was a good portion of them. Um, now we know the 1st Kansas got new uniforms just before this. In January, they paraded before their general and he made comments about how great they looked in their uniform. So this very well could fit with you know, knowing that this was these guys, it, it was they had their uniforms at that time. Uh, many of the written texts say that the Union infantry made it back to Baxter Springs. Uh, seven of those texts have the Union force at over 40 men. So if you count up how many is on the official casualty list, which is 18, then this artifact concentration could represent those people who were left on foot and not killed. If you had 25. Uh, infantry soldiers and 15 of them, the black soldiers, were killed on the official casualty list. What happened to the other 10 soldiers? Right? This may represent them. So here's a question, and we don't know for sure, but the rounds that were not musket rounds, is that evidence of soldiers from the 2nd Kansas Artillery? This picture is actually of the 2nd Kansas Artillery. Um, uh, this is an actual photograph of them. They didn't have any cannons there at the time, but they were on horseback. And I found carbine rounds and uh, you know pistol rounds. These guys were issued those rounds. Um, they were dropped right all amongst a bunch of musket rounds and right amongst a Union uniform and hat. 
so it's unlikely to have been an enemy. Um, we have an eyewitness account from a man named Hugh Thompson who says he got shot off his horse and ended up running into the woods with some of the black soldiers and ended up giving one of his pistols to one of the black soldiers. So this could represent somebody in a similar situation. Maybe their horse got shot, maybe they were on foot and not mounted when the surprise attack happened. Uh, now, there were teamsters there who drove the wagons, and these sorts of weapons could have been used by them. They would have been handy for wagon drivers to use. But the one eyewitness account we have says he thinks they were unarmed. He says, I believe, unarmed. He wasn't sure, but none of the rest of the sources say anything about it, so we don't really know. Um, if the first Kansas had a hard enough time getting muskets, what's the chances that they had pistols and carvings? I mean, they could have, but maybe not. So I think one of the more likely scenarios is that this is Union troops that were with the black soldiers. Maybe they weren't on their horses at the time. So it could have been a fighting retreat through the woods. Um, if there are a bunch of dropped rounds, that indicates the location of the troops, not what they were firing at. Uh, they weren't in straight lines, but that could be explained by the fact that they were hiding behind trees or things or what archaeologists call cultural and natural transformations, which is just a fancy way of saying things get moved over time, either by you know, the roots of the trees or the plowing of the field. or you know, If it was woods, it's not woods anymore, so at some point the trees were cut down and stumps were pulled, so that could have moved things around a little bit. Um, they were you know, a meter or so apart, so they're in their general original locations, but um, they're not in straight lines. Uh, the infantry at the time were trained to stay together in a group. You don't want to get cut off by yourself. Um, and crowds of people, when they're running from danger, will tend to bunch up. So um, this could explain the artifact concentration right there in the center of the, of the parkland. So if the fired rounds here are in the western side of the artifact scatter, um, and the range of those weapons is you know, 50 to 90 yards or so, Peace Church Road here is about 40 or 50 yards from where these rounds were. So if it was a fighting retreat, those fired rounds, they, they could have been standing right about where Peace Church Road is and hit there. So what you're looking at here could be a, what they call a redeployment at the run. You know, uh, it's easier to visualize on an attack. You would have your guys jog forward a certain distance, try to form up and fire a few volleys and then do it again. A fighting retreat is similar, just in reverse. You would, you know, you're trying to get back to your base at Fort Blair, so you would, you know, they, they would be standing here, firing toward the Raider farm, oops, and then ran back toward where the road is and made another few volleys as they were trying to make their way back. So, an open question is, could this be why the guerrillas decided to chase after the cavalrymen? you know, who were getting away. If the Union force was sort of split up because of the chaos of the attack, and you had these infantrymen firing large caliber weapons from the trees, and then you had these other horsemen riding away, at first you would think they would want to go after the, the infantrymen, but if they were in the woods putting up a defense, then it might have seemed easier to go after the guys on horseback. And um, you know, maybe this could explain why they chased the horsemen and didn't finish off the other ten or so uh, colored infantrymen that were there. And with that, if I can get, I'll leave it over to the uh, to our panel of experts, and we can talk about what all this might mean. Well, we'll start our program again here for our second half. Uh, this evening, I have asked Steve Cottrell, Steve Weldon, Roland Diggs, and Larry Wood to speak and elaborate on what we have just heard. But before that, I must introduce these fine gentlemen. Together, they have published 13 books and a massive array of articles. Steve, Roland, Larry, and Steve have studied and researched the Civil War era for a combined 100 years. They have appeared in paintings and book covers. They have assisted in battlefield preservation efforts and the creation of monuments. Roland C. Diggs, Sr., on the very end there, Roland, nice to see you, wrote the fabulous Thomas R. Livingston, His Life and Times, and Roland is one of the all-time great historical diggers, as he has masterfully unearthed fascinating details from our past. Or as he once put it, I spend most of my efforts putting closure on the yet unknown. 
Steve Cottrell. Steve received his introduction during the centennial celebration of Civil War when his grandfather introduced him to this era. He too has authored four Civil War books and was an extra in the opening scene in the Academy Award winning movie Glory and was in another battle scene in the Emmy Award winning TV miniseries North and South. Larry Wood, nice to have you Larry, is a prolific writer that has written seven Civil War books and numerous articles in an array of magazines which include America's Civil War, Blue and Gray Magazine, Missouri Historical Review, Missouri Life, the Ozark Mountaineer, and the Ozarks Reader. And finally, there's Steve Weldon, whom I have personally known the longest. Steve is the director of the Jasper County Records Center, a job that fits him so incredibly well. Steve is currently the president of the Missouri Civil War Reenactors Association, and for many years was a park ranger at Wilson's Creek. But best of all, <clears throat> I once was. But that was many years <laughs> ago, Brad. Of course. <laughs> but best of all, I can call them my friends and colleagues, <clears throat> for they have been an integral part of the board of directors. From our first meeting in 2009 and every occasion since then, I have been overwhelmed by their knowledge, passion, and expertise. So gentlemen, from the bottom of my heart, I thank you for being with us tonight and for ably serving on the board. The first question I have to ponder is, how does Chris's evidence change the narrative, or does it? It does. You know, the one thing that we... Yeah. <laughs> I was going to let you jump in there, Larry, and tell us that it did it change the narrative. Yes, it did. And it was a very important change. Uh, we're giving a lot of attention to this tonight, but the truth of the matter is very few people have ever given attention to this. Uh, this is, uh, for many of us that, that do know about this or have known about it, we're always like beating our heads against the wall getting people to pay any attention to this. There's the one old thing in, I guess, in the higher education in history, you've got to pass the so what test. And for the longest time, so what? In fact, I was somewhat thrilled that, that Chris got permission to come do a, an archaeological study at this site. So does this pass the so what test? Does it pass the so what test that some black soldiers are killed by some, or by some Confederate guerrillas? Does, is that enough? You know, is that enough? Probably not. It never was in the past, and especially if they all just ran away. How exciting is that? They're massacred, right? I love the way they use the term massacre. Because if you use the term massacre, that means you don't have to study anymore, do you? A massacre is a massacre. You know, people were killed. Well, this is far more than that. And what Chris has found out here, believe it or not, is extremely important. Um, you want to chime in here, Larry? But I did want to... <laughs> no, well, go ahead. Well, I, I just agree with what Steve said. And what Chris's research caused us to do is to go back and look at, at some of the records and kind of with a new eye and to see whether the popular narrative was re really justified, you know, whether the the record actually justified the popular narrative, which of course was what, like Steve said, that they all just kind of turned tail and ran. And what we found was basically the union side had been saying all along that they put up a fight, that, that they did not, you know, they did not just all turn tail and run. And go ahead and elaborate a little more on that. Well, <clears throat> what I want to say, why, why is this important? Okay, why is it important that these fellas didn't just run away? It's not very honorable, is it? You wouldn't think much of the 1st Kansas Colored Infantry, would you, if you thought they just ran away? And you especially wouldn't think very much of the 2nd Kansas Artillery Battery if they just ran away. Now, this has been the common, the, you know, the common thought. This is what's been going through. And I'll hurry up here, Brad, but I, but I did want to say this. In the Joplin Globe on May 17th, 2013, and they were just doing a story on this, and they quoted, I'm sure they found it online or whatever, this was a, a, a fellow by John Paul Rehnquist in his 2009 doctoral dissertation at the University of Kansas titled Color, Color No Longer a Sign of Bondage, Race, Identity, and the First Kansas Colored Volunteer Infantry Regiment, 1862-1865. This is what Mr. Rehnquist wrote. Instead of standing and dying in common cause with their, with their soldiers, the flight of the white officers set panic, set off a panic amongst the dismounted majority. Abolitionist sentiments evaporated in the face of imminent annihilation. That's kind of an insult, isn't it? Let's hear what well, this is some information that Larry found. In fact, Larry 
and Roland both had this information. They had it all along. It was right in front of them. They probably had it for years. And what did this do? This got them to go back and look at what they already had. This is from a Kansas newspaper. Which was that? That's uh, Leavenworth Daily Conservative, okay. which is uh, kind of a misnomer because they weren't conservative at all. <laughs> <laughs> Everything flip-flops, you know. Okay, this is from 531-1863. Under the inspiration of Major Ward, that's the commander of the expedition. Major Ward also, by the way, spends his time with the 1st Kansas Colored Infantry, and the most grievous action against them was at a place called Poison Springs, right? Poison Springs in Arkansas, where they were hunted down and killed. Uh, a very bad day for the 1st Kansas. But here is Major Ward a year or so earlier here at the event we're talking about. Under the inspiration of Major Ward, the men seized their arms, sallied together, and fell back fighting, the Major himself bringing up the rear. He was severely wounded in the hand, but never felt left his post of danger till the survivors reached camp. Our men fought desperately, both white and black. The later distinguished themselves in every instance. Fifteen escaped, all but one of whom was wounded. This is a tremendous survivor story that we've never heard before. And Major Ward has been accused of giving up his abolitionist sentiments by this fella who just simply made that up. Because you've never found anything that says that, have you, Larry? No. Steve, have you? No. Have you, Roland? Well, okay. Uh, you know, one thing I would like to, to add is the reason, I think, that we have had this popular narrative passed down to us is this is one of the few instances where the Confederate side of the story is the story that got told, that got passed down. Because the main document that we had, uh, the one that we, everybody was aware of anyway, was Major Livingston's report. And that was really the main document. And of course he told the Confederate side, the Southern side. The accounts that, we're that Steve and I are talking about now were Union accounts that were just published in newspapers in the immediate aftermath, but never, not an extensive write-up or, you know, nothing compared to what, to uh, Livingston's report, you know. And most of the time in doing Civil War research, you find that the Union side often survives and the Confederate side does not, but this was kind of a flip-flop of that. Yeah. Thank you, gentlemen. My next question is, can we explore a little deeper into the role of black soldiers? Uh, yes, I'd like to uh, start that little discussion on that. Uh, I got a few notes here, and I, I also want to say this is a wonderful crowd here tonight, and I know a lot of you live, or some of you anyway, live in that area, and you're curious about what in the world is going on where I live, you know, and I was just talking to Dale Gordon, guy I've known for years, good guy, uh, we used to work with him, and and uh, he lives out on Fur Road, and, and this is a very historic uh, piece of our heritage, is what's happening, that we are rediscovering this amazing uh, tale. Uh, it's, it's a tale of uh, horrendous uh, fighting, and yet a lot of bravery, and uh, uh, in a time of turmoil, which uh, in today's uh, tumultuous world, we can look back and say, wow, those folks really went through it, didn't they? We're not having as rough a time as they did. So, and, and a lot of these men were uh, black soldiers. And you, you wonder, well, why in the world was, uh, uh, we thought the 54th uh, Massachusetts out of that famous uh, epic film, Glory, they were the first. Well, the, the reason why uh, these, uh, this other regiment was earlier was simply because the amazing and uh, uh, controversial fellow uh, uh, Senator, Kansas Senator James H. Lane and his cronies uh, pioneered the recruitment of black soldiers before it was even allowed, before it was even legal across the Kansas border. They, uh, they started forming the first Kansas and the official name was Colored Infantry. Uh, regiment, uh, and uh, that's uh, the term, uh, that was a respectful term at the time, 
that times have changed, of course. But uh, uh, they formed these guys up and organized them and trained them um, in defiance of President Lincoln and others who hadn't even, you know, the Emancipation Proclamation hadn't even been issued, you know. It was, uh, uh, it was a rather um, a daring and uh, defiant uh, thing to do. And they wound up fighting, uh, as was pointed out by Chris, at, near Butler, Missouri at the Battle of Island Mound. Uh, and, uh, and they fought uh, uh, there uh, before the uh, 54th Massachusetts was even organized because when the Emancipation Proclamation was officially uh, signed was the 1st of January of 1863. He had, they had issued a preliminary one, but the official signing and when it became legal was January 1st of 1863, I believe. And, uh, and then the, uh, the recruitment of black soldiers was allowed and legal, but uh, over across the Kansas border, they didn't, they didn't care that much about what Washington was doing. They had the, uh, their own war going on along the Missouri-Kansas border, and by golly, they were using black soldiers as they saw fit. So that's how that happened. And uh, there was also a second Kansas colored infantry, and we might mention the first Missouri colored infantry uh, who wound up fighting at the uh, what's called the last battle of the Civil War, Palmito Ranch, uh, a month after Lee's surrender. Uh, when they, these organizations were later in, reorganized, and for instance, the first Kansas uh, colored uh, infantry was was later, uh, when it was reorganized on December 13th of 1864, designated the 79th United States Colored Troops, the USCT, they called them. And that's why you'll see on their headstones a lot of times, USCT. And uh, the second Kansas uh, became the 83rd United States Colored Troops. The first Missouri became the 62nd United States Colored Troops. And uh, at any rate, these were among the early uh, African-American soldiers uh, to fight in combat for our country uh, in an official manner. Although you can look at uh, other times in history, the Revolution, War of 1812, and all, all through the history, there were uh, black folks uh, that uh, participated in, in all of these uh, horrendous action, military actions. Uh, but yet, uh, uh, as far as being fully fully and officially part of the U.S. Army. This is very significant. And uh, right in our own backyard, one of the very first actions in the, in the history of, uh, you know, that sort of thing. So anyway, anybody want to add something to that? Great observation. Uh, Roland, uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, Mr. Livingston. Okay. Uh, first, I'd like to kind of say something along with what uh, Steve said a while ago about the number of people that have showed up here tonight. Uh, I'm I'm baffled. I'm I just don't understand, but I am tickled plumb to death. I would have never assumed, not in a half a lifetime, that there was that many people that was interested in a single subject or the Civil War. And I've been studying this since 1995, and I just can't believe it. So I want to thank everybody that's here because it, it's important. Now, let me talk about Tom Livingston, and I'm sure if you've read anything on history of Jasper County, uh, any of the history books, you've run across the name Major Tom R. Livingston. Let me give you a little background right quick. He was born in Washington County, Missouri. His father had died three months prior to his birth, so he became a child under a southern raised woman for the next 14 and a half years. That was his tutor. So he got the southern indoctrination, if you want to use that as a word. So that's how he grew up. 
His, his mother remarried 14 or 15 years later, and then she raised another family. <clears throat> One boy and three girls. The youngest of the boys, the one that was born first to her in her second marriage, of course, was his brother-in-law. He became a member of Livingston's group. I want to mention that, and then I'm going to digress back a little bit. Livingston was a lead miner in Washington County. He had relatives who were fairly well wealthy from a financial standpoint. They owned a lot of land. His second father, or his stepfather, his name was Parkinson. So when you read the story and you're talking about Livingston's half-brother, that is where that connection is made. He decided as the lead mining criteria dropped off in Washington County, that he needed to be looking for a better place to go to continue that endeavor because he was a lead miner. And he was also involved in railroad building. And one of the things that passes a lot of people up on Tom Livingston, he ran a contract for the Iron Mountain Railroad that was built he was one of those, I, we were not able to find out exactly what his profession was or the title or what they did, but he had a contract with the Iron Mountain in, in 1857. Let me back up a second. Tom Livingston was born in 1820. In 1857, he, his family came to Jasper County. He mainly came here because one of his other friends was a land speculator. He was going everywhere in the state of Missouri and other places and buying land. One of the things a lot of people don't realize, Tom Livingston owned over 500 acres in Section 10 in Jasper County. Almost the whole 640 acres. So he himself was not a poor man. <laughs> he was a lead miner. He had furnaces running in Granby. He had hotels in Granby, involved in saloons, a lot of things. So he was a well-rounded, well-educated individual. When the war broke out, he had already been to Vernon County and with some of the other military organizations and had established a good reputation. General Price is the person who appointed Captain Tom Livingston to his first military post. So as a captain, he started his ranger outfit. Then it became a battalion. Eventually, it ended up being a regiment. So he went from captain to major. Most of the time, he was a major. At the very end, before he was killed at Stockton at the courthouse, he had been promoted. He made a trip down to uh, visit with General Cooper in Arkansas, picked up quite a few recruits, came back. That boasted the amount of, that put him up to a regiment size, and he became a colonel. When he died, he was the rank of a colonel. Uh, the other item I want to discuss is supplies in this area for the Confederacy. There were no posts in this area run by the Confederate government. How did he get his supplies? Wagon trains of those from the Union service when they brought him in to the post, Fort Scott, different places. He captured those wagon trains, took the supplies, used them in his men, weapons, clothes, everything. So the wagon train thing was one of his things he really parlayed into something great 
and was well liked by his men because he kept them supplied. Thank you, Roland. Our final question, how did two days in May influence Jasper County history? And what is the importance of understanding local Civil War history, period? Well, the two days in May, are, we're talking about the Raider Farm, but this actually has to do with a lot of activities that were going on in, <clears throat> in May of 1863. And pri Baxter Springs is established by the 1st Kansas Colored Infantry, the first time they're actually acting as their own regiment. And they're put there specifically to deal with Livingston and his attack on wagon trains on the military road. And one thing to, that a lot of times you hear that this is just a local thing. This is not local at all. This, is a mili this is, has to do with military operations dealing with a whole department. If the military road, if you go down 69 Highway, that's roughly military road, that's what we think of it. It goes from north of uh, Fort Leavenworth, travels all the way down to Fort Scott, goes all the way down to Fort Gibson, down to Fort Smith. And it's the principal, and Chris had talked about that, it's the principal supply line. This is not a local event here, folks. You know, this, this whole business, we want to, to give you some idea of why this is not local. Um, the first Kansas Colored was uh, organized up in northeast Kansas, around that area, Leavenworth, Lawrence, that area. And there were some black, educated black men who were talked to, they, they conversed with them about the idea of, of opening up a, or starting a regiment of the first Kansas Colored. And one of them was a Mr. Langston from Oberlin College. Is that in Ohio? Yes. Is in Ohio, Oberlin College. Uh, believe it or not, uh, there were some quite educated people of color back in those days. And they would come to Kansas as the abolitionist state. But anyway, Mr. Langston was asked about the idea of organizing this first Kansas Colored Volunteer Im Infantry. Uh, Joplin has a fellow by the name of Langston Hughes. Remember Langston Hughes, the great poet? That's Langston Hughes' grandfather. So this is not a, this is not a simple, local, yokel <laughs> thing. This whole activity, including what happened here, is extremely important. And we're not, we're not even, we're not even touching the surface of the significance of what happened to the black soldiers here and because of how early this happened. If you want to talk about a bunch of firsts, if you want to talk about African-American history, African-American military history, what occurs here is extremely important in that history. But what was your question, Brad? <laughs> <laughs> now you see what I go through when we have meetings. <laughs> I, I want to elaborate just a little bit. Uh, particularly what one way that what happened here influenced not just the department but the nation was how blacks were going to be treated you know that was a particularly uh, Colonel Williams and Major Livingston ne negotiated on what they were going to do with the prisoners and, and Livingston specifically said that he would not treat the black soldiers as soldiers you know that he considered them contraband and as Chris said in his uh, presentation, you know, they started killing each other, killing each other's prisoners, or killing their own, you know, their prisoners. So that became a contentious, well, contentious issue, and here is really where it kind of first came to a head, I think. Well, Lincoln, I think it was in July, uh, gave an executive order, I guess, <clears throat> that basically said what Williams had already done here. Williams said, we'll play tit for tat that if you don't treat our soldiers as soldiers, if you don't exchange them like we have been exchanging, if you murder them, if you kill them, send them back into slavery or whatever it may be, according to the, uh, to the dictates of the Confederate Congress, if you do that, we will do tit for tat. Link Lincoln gave that order in July. Williams already played tit for tat here, killing an innocent Confederate prisoner in exchange for the death because of the death of a, of a black soldier here. So yes, it, you're right, Larry. Well, also, uh, also I'd like to point out that uh, uh, our vision of this historic and hallowed ground uh, involves uh, being nonpartisan as far as how it's presented at the park itself. Um, 
of course there was a devastating injury to the black regiment here there was also devastating injury uh, the very next day to uh, to southern sympathizers who had their entire town of Sherwood, Missouri burned to the ground by U.S. soldiers. And we're talking about women and children suddenly homeless who have no insurance back in those days. So uh, a lot of suffering, a lot on both sides, and we want to this park to um, convey that to people. Uh, simply tell the story. I think uh, Steve pointed out real well, uh, he went to uh, the Little Bighorn Battlefield uh, a couple of years ago, and in their museum, they don't, um, they don't pull any punches, they just tell exactly what happened. And there was suffering on both sides, and that's how they tell it at Little Bighorn. We want to tell it that way here too, and um, so I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, let me just say real quick. Let, let me just say real quick. Uh, you know, the residents were put in a very difficult place after this. Um, imagine if you were, you know, had your homestead here. You know, and a group of armed men would come by and demand supplies. If you didn't give it to them, they'd probably hurt you, kill you, take it anyway, right? A little bit later, another group of armed men would come through and accuse you of aiding the enemy, right? No matter which side was the first one and the second one and sometimes you didn't even know if they were fight which side they were fighting on and a lot of the people in the area simply fled the area they left the area or they were killed so. oh individual's name again i'll throw out there fellow by the name of hugh l thompson a lot of this probably half of everything that we know today, if there hadn't have been a fellow by the name of Hugh L. Thompson, who had this terrible urge to write, and he wrote articles for the newspapers, and they were put in the newspaper. His first attempt, he wrote under a pen name of Leon Boyd, but he wrote about the Civil War. Those papers did not show up till about nine months ago. Honestly, 152 years that went by, these papers, the newspapers that he wrote these stories for, they're now available. So you can see that this is an ongoing, we never know when we're going to end up getting another surprise, <laughs> but that is, you know, that's, that's the way this thing works. And, and Hugh L. Thompson, and then later in about, and we're guessing on this, around 1890, 1895, prior to his death in 1908, he wrote another story under his own pen name from memory about Fort Baxter. And he covers, he was, an in, he was the scout for Colonel Williams. So you can real quick see a connection between people that wrote a lot of this later and was there when it happened. The first time he talks about it, he didn't want nobody to know that he had observed all of this. He wrote it under a pen name. It took us a while to get all that straightened out too. So it's, it is super interesting, and we're, we're, again, tickled to death that everybody's here. Thank you, gentlemen. To conclude tonight, we have a six-minute film we are premiering. The film covers our plans and vision for the Sherwood Raider Farm Civil War Park. We must thank Cable One and their creative staff, and Carrie Boyd, who was production manager and cameraman, and film editor Don Doss is not with us, but executive producer and director Jim Reidenhauer is. Jim? Take a bow, thank you. We thank you for your time and effort. Also, I'd like to uh, thank three gentlemen who became the faces of this production, uh, Paul Lewis and Ogis Davis. Would you gentlemen please stand up? <laughs> and you'll recognize our narrator, but he's one of our panelists here, so we'll go ahead and look at this film.
Hello folks, I'm Steve Cottrell. I've written several books on local history, but I'm really happy to be part of a park committee that's helping to develop this land here. Its official name is the Jasper County Sherwood Raider Farm Civil War Memorial Park. I know that's a mouthful, so you might want to call it just for short, the Jasper County Civil War Park. This is approximately five acres situated at the intersection of Fountain Road and Peace Church Road on the outskirts of good old Joplin, Missouri. And thanks to the generosity of the Hershaway family and the foresight of the Jasper County Commissioners, it's now a county park. Historical research shows beyond a shadow of a doubt that this land was a significant location in what is known as the Battle of Raiders Farm. Also, the old military records sometimes refer to it as the action at Sherwood, Missouri, because Sherwood was the nearest town located just to the west. It was a rough old days when a brutal, ruthless guerrilla war raged through this region, right where we now peacefully live. Let's take a look around the park. Most of you have heard of the Battle of Carthage, which took place early in the Civil War, or War Between the States, whichever you prefer to call it, and that was about 15 miles from here. That was the wake-up call for our part of the region here to know that full-scale war had come to our doorsteps. In the spring of 1863, two years into the war, a much more sinister and darker form of warfare swept through this region. It was a ruthless guerrilla war, not the clash of regular armies. Private citizens, not only men, but women and children, their homes, their farms, their very lives were in serious danger. It was May 18th of 1863 when the guerrilla force of Major Tom Livingston, a local Confederate leader, burst from the woods over there and attacked a detachment of U.S. soldiers who were foraging for food. The gunfire was intense. The action moved to the west across this very land. Most of the casualties that day were former slaves, members of a unit called the 1st Kansas Colored Infantry Regiment. Not only will this park memorialize the action that took place on this land, but it will also commemorate the actions during the Civil War era that took place in this immediate vicinity, such as the destruction of the town of Sherwood, Missouri. Sherwood was located to the west, where J.J. Highway intersects Fur Road on the outskirts of present-day Carl Junction. It was burned to the ground by U.S. soldiers the very day after the action here in retaliation since most of the citizens of the town were Confederate sympathizers. Also, this park will help preserve the memory of Native American involvement in the war in our region. Numerous Cherokees served under Major Tom Livingston and his guerrilla force and fought across this very land. Also, Osage warriors played a role in the war in our area. Another guerrilla band under Colonel Charles Harrison camped near here before starting off on an expedition that would take them across the border onto Osage territory, where the Osage would attack Harrison's band and totally decimate it. Our park committee has plans to revamp this old barn into a proper time period structure from the Civil War era, and perhaps include some historical displays inside. Also, we want to build some other outbuildings, most importantly, a pine farmhouse that will represent the Raider house itself. In essence, to create a little homestead from the Civil War era, which would be a wonderful venue for events, perhaps a festival every year. It would be a beautiful learning tool for school children and for adults. But we need your help. Please consider contributing to our cause to preserve this not only for us but for future generations to learn about our colorful Jasper County heritage. And if you want more details about the guerrilla fight that took place on this very site, 
simply go to YouTube and type in Ambush at Raiders Farm. Well, thanks a lot for your time, folks, and have a great day.